all academics, right? You know, just go through the definitions and so forth, just to close this space so that we all discussing from the same point of view, right? Then from there, I'll give my own view about collaboration that I think ought to be happening, give some case studies, but then open it up to all of you because I think at the end of the day, it's not about some of us who are sitting in ivory towers, but it's about what we can achieve together with yourselves in the spaces where you find uh, yourselves working, whether you're in private sector, you're in public sector, you're, you are navigating both of them. So without wasting time, at the end of the day, right, for me, collaboration and partnership, you know, they merge. Some might be a bit legal compared to other ones, which are a bit easier. You know, when you talk about partnerships, you know what partnerships do, ne? We all have partners, eh? you know, for some, and then some are legal, some are in transition, some are, you know, um, but when you talk about collaboration, it's a little easier, you know, to, to conceptualize. I'm going to collaborate. It's intermittent and, you know, after a while you move away. You know, you can always come back. But for the sake of this discussion, we're going to pull them together. But let me just run through them. You can all read, right? I'm going to pick key points. That, I mean, when we talk about collaboration, it's basically engagement that we are going to have between institutions. Remember, my focus is on research. And I'll tell you why research and not teaching and learning uh, or community engagement or any other thing. When I, I, I spoke to the chair about this collaboration, especially in terms of research, the issue was that the and I'm going to be controversial. Where are the two? Where is Mzi? No, 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 they'll join us. It's slide number four and five. So by the time they come, we'll be there. You know, it's said that the research is not being done. You know, one in your practices, because we have this concept of research as something that is only in academic institutions, you know. Uh, and the challenges are that the academic institutions are going to get patients who might not be eligible for the kind of research that we want to do. By the, by the time they come to the Vetsies and then Western Cape, the SMU, the conditions are worse and they cannot be the research participants. But these guys have gone through your practices, right? Where you become a catchment area. Yeah? But then even the feedback that should be coming to you as a clinician, to inform your practice is not given because once I'm published, that's it. You know, I'm going to be cited throughout the world. People are going to then, you know, it's, it's good for me, but we don't lose the loop. Hence this issue of collaboration. So essentially we have many types of collaborations. You know, the ones that we talk about all the time is, is the one that is voluntary. It doesn't work. I think from voluntary to affiliation, it becomes increasingly more binding. But for, for the context, I'll just run through them, that you can have a voluntary collaboration. We just come in as people who volunteer to be there. But you might have a consortium where the ideas are a little more solid, the federation is a bit legal, etc. What is more important for me is that you also have levels. Collaboration does not have to be national or international. It can also be amongst us as individuals, right? If you're in one department, you can collaborate because you bring in different things to the collaboration. It might be interdisciplinary, it might be extradisciplinary, and transdisciplinary. So you move from one department, you collaborate to the next one. But you can also move from one discipline to the next and incorporate people that ordinarily you would not use. We have a different concept in academia now. They call it IPE, Interprofessional Education. So it has become part of how we have to teach. So your second years, first years will actually meet. You'll have a dental therapist, oral hygienist, and a dentist. Then you bring a physio, you know, you bring whoever. Then they are given a case study so that you begin to collaborate as disciplines. At the end of the day, a patient cannot be broken into many pieces, right? One is costly. Number two is that the, the patient does not get the best service. So collaboration is a given. 
It should be a natural process. Unfortunately, we don't do things that way. All right, we're moving on quickly. Partnerships, I think I've spoken about them. Partnerships are a little tricky. You know, I try to find definition of partnerships in healthcare. We collaborate, we are not partners. In actual fact, we act in silos in healthcare. But these are more legal and business, you know, uh, uh, terminologies. Where you have general partnership, yeah, we're there, we partners. Eh? You, know, you know, yeah, there are strings, but the strings are not visible. You know, but then we have limited partnership. We spell it out very clearly what can happen and not happen. Then some of them are going to be a bit more sophisticated. You know, where you have limited liability. I'm not going to accept, you know, certain liabilities you do A, B, C, and D, all right? You know, but the features are generally the same. You share either profits or losses, you know. Uh, there's mutual agency. Every single person has the right you know, or is allowed to speak for themselves. It might be in a lawful business or just a contractual obligation. If, if, if you've missed something, just relate to your own partnerships, right? Social ones, right? In summary, in summary, I just want to get through this part so that we can talk about the collaboration. Collaboration and partnerships are deliberate, and they have to be. They are not going to happen by themselves. You really have to think about it. They are intentional and they take hard work. I've been involved in research partnerships and, and collaborations, you know, with individuals somewhere within the institution, somewhere outside the institution. It's hard. I mean, you have to then timetable, you have to share certain information. You know, you must keep each other engaged all the time. You know, it takes hard work, but there are lots of benefits for that. So I'm saying, from my own experience, it should be a natural process. It must be an organic makeup of any institution that wants to reach a different height. If you don't collaborate, you are on your own. You know, I don't know in English, you know, uh, but in Zanavaramoto, I pay you know. So, so you really, really, when you are alone, you worse than when you have people who might even be fighting, right? Because they just have different ideas. So to be by yourself is not helpful. Hence, I'm saying collaboration and partnerships are, are just something that needs to be a part of your process. And even in the public sector, you know, people in private sector tends to collaborate more. I mean, clinically, somebody will be saying, I do endodontics, refer patients to me, right? I'm saying collaboration on, on, on clinical practice only. And the other person will be doing crown and bridge work or doing pediatric dentistry and so forth. It happens naturally because, I mean, you then specialize, you know, uh, and then you can do more, you know, with less work. And you can earn more. I mean, we tend to do it. In the public sector, I'm not sure whether that happens, why you find that one individual in clinic X, you know, is good at this kind of procedures. So you just send the patients there. It, it, it is good for the patients, actually. But I mean, not all partnerships or collaborations actually work. They fail for very many reasons, right? One is that the people find themselves in different stages of life, literally, you know, or even in their careers. Especially in dentists, some people would not want to do certain work anymore because they've done it. Ne? especially for the junior ones, they'll tell you, nah, nah, nah. you know, I've done this kind of work several times over, so it's your chance to do it. I don't know whether they are giving the opportunity to build experience or they are just being irresponsible, you know, but it happens. So that's a very big issue. On, on the research level, sometimes we don't see things different. Our vision is different. Uh, we, we did a project, you know, as different institutions, you know, five institutions. I'm not going to say what that project is, but I mean, we did not agree on, on the scope of that project. Actually, let me just say it. It's the National Oral Health Survey, right? <laughs> the one that has eluded us for a very long time, for a very long time. To date, we have not even conducted that. But the issue was the scope. 
We wanted to do the survey because we don't even know the burden of disease in this country. <laughs> we don't know. Any person who's going to tell you how much dental caries we have in this country, they're lying. We don't have that information. That's not been done. But it was wrangling between specialists in dental public health, right? You know, on what needed to be included in the scope of work. You cannot start natural oral health survey and you only do the DMFT, the malocclusion. You must look at other things, right? You know, habits, you know, determinants and so forth, so that when you begin to inform the country about the bed, then you know what the causes of the causes are for the clinical outcome that you have. But we had this kind of, you know, eventually a pilot was done. Somewhere we just learned after the pilot was done. You know, we still don't have the results of the pilot to then work on it. But I can assure you it's going to happen. You know, it's going to happen. But that's, that's what I'm saying. Collaborations are intentional. Uh, partnerships require work, you know, and I think people just need to be aware of what they can do. But what are the benefits of these things? A whole lot. One thing is that the, if you are too many, you know, and you have a shared vision, you know, you are efficient. Unlike what we normally think about, that we have too many people in the room, you know, you never get anywhere. No, you do, provided they have common sense of purpose. You know, because you can harness that energy, right, and use it. They are going to come from different influences, point of view, and that helps. Um, and in academia, you'll be told that, I mean, people who publish as a team, the quality of work is out of this world, especially because they think differently or they're at different levels in terms of their academic, you know, achievement, right? So their inputs are going to be totally different. I mean, we, we, we've seen people who are going, there are, there are a few individuals who are going to publish by themselves and publish in high impact journals. But generally teams do very well. You know, it encourages creativity. We can go through the whole list. I think the slides are going to be made available. I'll send them through if you want to go through them. I just want to summarize and go to other things. The same thing happens. Your funders, there's an expectation that we also need to raise funds for our own research, right? I mean, we, we don't get money for research uh, at SMU, you know, so you have to generate your own funds. But it's a worldwide practice, and yeah. I mean, if I don't publish, I can't do anything. I mean, when the chair said I must get myself here, I said, yeah, it's fine, I have research money, you know. So I just applied and got myself here. But if you don't publish, you don't generate the research money. But if you don't have research money, you cannot do better work, right? So it's a, it's a vicious cycle. You just need to start. And once you start, you don't stop, you know. Uh, and, and funders do the same. So I can approach the funders because now I'm published, you know, I can say I have so many publications to my name. You know, I have the necessary skills to conduct research. So it's a vicious cycle, but we need to start and get it there. The only way to do it is to get people who have done it before. And I need to emphasize from here that uh, there's nothing stopping any of you who's sitting here to publish with me or any other staff member who's in academia, nothing. Except that don't give it to me very late and you expect that I must do some magic. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we have one project that we need to finish. He's looking at me and I said, yeah, 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 I know. You know, that we need to finish. It came at a very bad time, right? But I mean, the individual was doing great, so we still have to finish that so that she can publish, but we do it. So, I've given an idea of collaborations and these partnerships and the benefits, you know, but it doesn't happen on its own. There's a research environment that exists, and I'm going to touch on the three, you know, so that we have a sense of, of where you can find yourselves. One is individuals or organization. I'm going to touch on the three. I'm going to look at research environment in universities, that's number one. So that I give you a sense of what that environment is all about, so that if you intend to collaborate, you know, you have a good idea. I also give my own opinion. I'm happy that we have private sector, public sector. You know, it's my opinion. If you disagree, we can then hammer it together here. I'm going to tell what my experience is of private practice as a research environment and the public sector. So. One, in academia, we don't have dental scientists. 
And I'm going to tell you why. Amen. You do your BDS, oral hygiene, and whatever. Then from there, you finish, you go to private practice, and you come back, right? You enter into that space. What training did you get? Most of you who qualified a while ago did not even do research methodology in that curricula. It's just been introduced now. No, past five, six years, the Health Professions Council said we need to do it. So how do you build that capacity? You don't. That is why in academia, very few individuals, including HODs, don't have research knowledge. It is a problem in all dental schools, I'm going to tell you now. Guys are going to do their clinical work and they'll be stuck with research to complete. Well, we're making changes to get it right, ne? by developing committees and so forth, train, etc. but we don't have dental scientists. Even when you have that, the mix is skewed. It's skewed to us, the clinicians. We don't have people who are strong in oral biology and so forth staying in academia because of the way we appoint staff. Almost 90% of the staff in institutions, dental schools and so forth, are appointed by Department of Health. It doesn't matter which province you are. And we're talking about that it's more skewed to service because when you're appointed as a joint appointee, you're appointed by the Department of Health. Ne? So the primary response will become service. Teaching and learning and research is secondary. But it has to be done. So where do you get an opportunity to develop that skill set? Very difficult. That's one. Is the funding model is very bad. And until it changes, we're not going to compete with other people in the world. I'll give you a sense, I have a slide, where I want you to look at the type of research that we produce. The type of research that we produce in the country is not taking us any fair at all because of this talent that we don't have, you know? I mean, uh, a few years ago, we started to get this desensitizing toothpaste, ne? Yeah, yeah, they started to come into the market thick and fast, yeah? Where do they come from? Well, it's sense of that, and it's a, it's, a, it's a global country, right? But I mean, GSK, they just bring them into these countries. But the research is not done here or anywhere in the developing world, yeah? In those institutions, they have oral biologies, they have chemists, they have whatever. They have the whole shebang. Dentists are just to test it on patients. So by the time it gets to clinicians, it's done. So we're not going to be on the cutting edge because we don't have the correct mix. Same thing will happen to the endodontics, you name it, Crown and Bridge, Red Siemens, and so forth. We are at the end, we are just consumers. We are not part of that cutting edge. But it doesn't mean we cannot do some kind of research that can inform the world. If we have the burden of disease, we need to start to think differently and say, what are the questions that we have as clinicians on the ground? And how do we get that to come to academia? Who's, who is just going to help you with the methodology? Like I said, patients are in your clinics. By the time they come to teaching institutions, it's late. You know, Even the kind of intervention that we have. We'll be publishing a study on, on amyloblastoma, one of the guys. It's a 30-year review of amyloblastoma cases that we have. What we've observed is that the, the age is becoming less and less and less and less. In the past, people used to be diagnosed, you know, 45 and something like that. African state or so, but now we're getting younger and younger. You know, we still don't know why. In this country, the north, Limpopo, most cases are in Limpopo. We don't know why, right? So these are some of the questions that when you find as clinicians, you bring them to the academia and we begin to collaborate because we cannot generate those kind of questions given the model that we have. The worst part of, of this research environment becomes talent management. It takes a long time to develop staff members to be at the level that you want them, whether it's research, teaching, or clinical. After that, we lose them. We don't have a mechanism to retain them. And when we see the bright sparks, we don't have a way of identifying them, you know, developing them, deploying them, and, re and retaining them. That has to change if we have to compete, you know, because that's the future. 
So, so let me give you a picture. I mean, I tried to review literature that is available. I did not find it. Here, I was not going to hypothesize. I wanted to give you something that is tangible and published. I just want to have a look at some of the numbers. But if you look at, if you look at the numbers, I mean, that in, in five years, the number of articles that were published in this country were 305, 32%. Nigeria, 35. Yes, Nigeria's population is huge, right? Compared to us. So you expect them to do more per capita. But this is where we are. Let me move faster. Then let's look at the institutions. Well represented, all of us. Remember, when the study was done in the University of New York, South Africa, then you have VET, you have whatever. So all the institutions in the country are represented. Right? Pretoria, Western Cape, VETS, and SMU or Medunza are represented. Yeah? This is just the languages. Depending where you find yourself and who you are, you know, but this is the critical slide. This is the most important slide that I want us to look at, and I'll explain. <coughs> look at clinical trials. Clinical trials are more informative. They talk about the efficacy of the treatments that we, we use. So we're sitting here, and I mean, we cannot make a decision about treatment A versus treatment B versus treatment C because we don't do those studies. Is there? I mean, just. 0.5%, not much. So let's look at the studies that we do, cross-sectional studies. I come to this group and I collect information and I want to make claims. Eh? I can't do that. Cross-sectional studies are biased studies. Because when I come and say I want to see whether if I give you A, you're going to get that, the truth of the matter is that I didn't study with you here where I know your condition, right? You're sitting here, some of you might have the condition for a very long time. So I don't know, but we do a whole lot of cross-sectional studies. So in terms of clinical management, they are less informative, but we do them because they are convenient and they serve our purpose. And our purpose is that uh, if I don't publish, I perish. If I don't publish, I don't get promoted. Right? So I need four publications a year to maintain my academic status. If for three years it goes this way, well, it's not going to happen very fast, but it could. Some institutions are going to tell you that in a five-year tenure, if you don't publish four papers and whatever, they're going to demote you. Remember, professorship is not a qualification. It's an investigator. When we leave the university, we take it away. So guys, don't be confused. When I'm out of the university, I qualified as a dentist. I'm Dr. Motloba, right? No, no, we had this conversation with some individuals who, at some point, he was not affiliated, right? Out of academia. And I said, hey, Dr. Sambudi, how are you? He was peace. No, 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 they can't be. Unless you are emeritus, right? So they give it to you, the university council meet and say, this man has achieved so much, so we're giving it to him. Any other person, when they leave academia and they are not emeritus, Go back to the roots. Call them Dr. Somebody. No, no, that's true. So we need to maintain that level of, of, of achievement. But very, very important, colleagues, that the, the kind of studies that we do are not informing your practice at all. Only 5% of the studies are going to inform you. You can't take a case study. You can't take one case study. You need more case studies, right? And case studies don't do anything else but to just give us a pattern. The 19, uh, 1981 uh, HIV saga, right? You know, you see one case of a homosexual man, then from there you say, no, it appears as if this guy said this and that and that you are. It creates or it formulates, or it generates a hypothesis. We begin to suspect, right? Then from there we need to do better studies to confirm. So we are in trouble. And the reason why in travel is because we don't have enough. In dentistry, the studies are underpowered. That they have very few individuals who are going to be part of them. And they lie in your clinics. Hence, I'm saying it becomes very, very important to collaborate. But we can talk about those things. Let me talk about state of public health or research. Research in the public sector. Research, nothing else. It's intermittent and uncoordinated. Find me one, one project that was done in the public sector that has made it to the finality of research. 
If research is not published, né, is unethical. Yes, if you don't publish it or you don't well present it, especially to the participants, it's illegal, it's unethical. It's wrong. The purpose of research is to inform. Nothing else. Whether you like the results or you don't, you inform. So if you don't inform, we have a problem. So I'm saying in the public sector, the kind of research that was done, I still have to find it. It is done and it's fired. Two years ago, we were involved in this COVID big thing. Eh? You know, we are part of the, 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 the center and helping. We did a lot of research. What we did is that we told them straight, no, 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 no. We went to publish. But for some groupings, they did not publish. Some of us were in the academia and formed part of a group, took the data and published it. But people employed by the Department of Health did not publish their data. It's sitting somewhere else. To get that data becomes a problem. We're still trying to get it so that we can publish it. I'm saying a lot of research that is done, we find that there's thing to qualification. I'm the head of the department, you know, collect the data and I use it for my qualification, that's it. But, and so forth. And I'm saying, you normally have reports that are going to collect that somewhere else. It's unfortunate. You worry about the rigor. You know, there's a lot of red tape as well. So I wonder if we can say it's over-regulated or unregulated. But both of them actually stifle the research process in the public sector. <coughs> like I said, if you don't publish research, it is a problem. It's unethical. Let's look at the private sector. I'm going to tell you now. This is the project, this is what you want to do. Especially with the opinion leaders. We have a whole lot of opinion leaders. Into ontology, this and that and that. Then from there you get a collective. Then the research is going to be done with Sarona, this and that and that. And it gets published in some journal, whether it's accredited or not. So it's opportunistic for both the researcher and the service provider. You know, so it's it's but once again, some collaboration happens, even in academia. I don't know why that happened. Well, I mean, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll give you some money to travel around. You know, yeah, 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 to travel around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, they'll send you to a conference somewhere internationally and you move around the country and present your findings because GSK wants to make a point, right? And so forth and so on. Yeah, we wonder how patients are protected. Because remember, these are the patients that come to your practice. Right? Can they say no to the kind of treatment that you're giving them? I don't think so. And if they can't, they won't say no. Medical paternalism is big. If you're going to recruit patients in your own practice, the likelihood is that they are not going to refuse the kind of intervention. But they should have a right to refuse at any stage. Yeah? But they won't. But uh, we can talk about those things. Now, So, 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 we're saying here that the collaboration happens. But I mean, 50 to 60 percent of collaboration fails. You know, uh, uh, which, which, is, which is something that we know. And the reasons I think I've given them, we must, we must avoid the mismatch of, 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 of goals and expectations. You know, you also need to partner with people who are going to advance you. So I wonder, in terms of the private sector, the public sector, and academia, do we know who has the best skills for whatever you know, research collaboration that we want? And I think that's the biggest thing. The biggest thing is that the one, you'll find that the, in the public, you want a certain product. Let's say your office, for example. You want a certain product. You need to develop this model for delivery of a system. The timelines might not be conducive to some of us in academia. But then you might also have your pleasure and the power that be. As a manager, you also account to a head of department who accounts to somebody else, and it might be 2022 before the national election somewhere. These things happen, right? You know? No, 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 I'm being serious about this thing. So collaboration needs people to really think carefully about what you want to do. It's easier these days because we have access to material. When I say materials that they are your, your online stuff, pictures and things like this, you don't collaborate. You know, 
easy, but it takes a lot of time. We've sent a couple of prisoners to you guys. We wanted to make an example. I was going to make the analysis, right? Send it to you guys. How many of you are going to then go on that online survey and complete it? Just be honest. I mean, you guys have been exposed, no? Let's say to three, four. How many of those did you complete? Out of the four, the last four that you had, how many did you complete? But that is the problem, isn't it? We don't know much about the effect or the impact of COVID-19 on oral health. We don't know. And it's sitting here, right? If we were to conduct that study, we're going to have a problem. Unfortunately, this happens too often. There was a study that was published in the England Journal of Medicine two years ago. It was talking about justice and research. And the point was that the research is done, especially in clinical trials, on white males more than anybody else. And all other people wanted to be represented. Yeah. Which is true. I mean, yes, we have uh, analgesics and implementaries that are tested on white men. The physiology of a white man is not the same as the physiology of a white man. It's as simple as that, right? There are several commonalities, but there are nuances that are there. So if you're not going to do that study in white women, they don't get the full benefit of the intervention. The same thing will happen to blacks, whatever, age, and so forth. That is why even the COVID-19 vaccines are done in different age groups, so that you can then understand, you know, these nuances of the intervention. But that's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is that if those individuals that are targeted don't want to participate, we have a problem. And the biggest problem that we have is that the clinicians don't participate, but they want statements to be made about them with respect to the findings of research. So this is the message that I'm trying to give to you guys, that if you're not going to be part of the solution, somebody is going to we failed. We've never had national oral health survey in the post-1994 era. Yes. Actually, we've never had one in this country that represented every single person. This is an epic failure. Yes, we never had one. The one that you learned about, learned about was done in metros. We you know, people who have been the studies went to a place that was comfortable, right? They then, counting, they went to Tuan and something like that and collected data from everybody else, right? Because they could find them and it was safe. Studies were done by Van Veik, ne? So, so, so we've never had this study done. And if we don't know that, how do we plan for oral health in this country? Do you know how many people we need to train? I'm saying that is very serious. But we're going to do it. It has to happen. And when that happens, it's part of the collaboration that I'm talking about. We've spoken to a few people in, in, in you know, um, State South Africa to look at sampling models, yeah? For a population of 60 something million to be represented, you don't need a whole lot of sampling. There are techniques that they can use statistically, you know? to get three, 4,000 to represent the entire population. But when we do that, it means that all of you, depending where you are, we might not have people in the public sector, but in the private sector. We have to partner because, and I'm saying this to all of you, because that information is going to be useful to yourselves in private practice, right? To then estimate the number of people and the conditions that could be in your vicinity. Then you can plan better. You might actually have to close shop, by the way. You might be sitting in a space where you don't have enough pathology. Remember, when you don't have pathology, you are unemployed, right? Essential. So you might actually have to make a strategic relocation. Go somewhere else and run your practice. So it's, it's one of the collaborations that we need to make. There might be other ideas. I'm going to give you mine. I think the establishment of the National Dental Practice-Based Research Network is critical. Many countries have this kind of network. It's voluntary. 
clinicians go in there and say, we might have a project. Let's say you're going to run a, 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 a you know, fluoridation program, physiocelian program that you want to then expand. A protocol is going to be developed and all the clinicians who might be interested in participating in that study, they, they get involved, right? Recruit the patient, you're going to be advised on the process that you need to follow. We get the sample size that we require, the patient who are eligible and so forth. The benefit of that is that the patients also feel involved you know, in how they manage. But the critical part is that the, the data that you get informs how you manage the patients. It can be done on anything. I mean, we have so many interventions in dentistry that we don't know if they work. We put fissure sealants ne? on the 60s. Can any of you guess a survival rate of those fissure sealants in the first year? Let's say we seal all the 60s of the six-year-old. Seal four, one, two, three, four, we seal them. After six months, how many fissure sealants are of 50%? Whatever the number, that information is going to inform the practice. Whether it's a cost-effective intervention or we need to do bad, or whether we need to retrain, or we just need to hire somebody whose job is going to put, put fissure sealants because, I mean, more than 50% of the fissure sealants are off, and they're put by all of you, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so it's either we retrain because you guys have forgotten how to put fissure sealants, or, eh? well, they could be, you know, but, but if those things are done in practices, they go a long way. Um, the other thing that I, I think is important is case control studies. Case control studies is that in your practice, you find people who have a condition of interest and you manage it, but you don't necessarily have to uh, uh, do a randomized controlled trial. The reason for that is that the, we don't see a lot of cases in the clinic, like I said, before it's too late. And the cases are sitting with you guys in the clinic. So if you want to follow very rare conditions, we don't see it here, but uh, a similar study was done in Nigeria. No, man, eh? Your cancram oris. You don't see it. But I mean, when you have several practices that are sitting there, you are able to then collect information from those practices, you know, and then publish on it, inform the rest of the guys. Very, very important. But these are some of the things that are available to us. So what are the opportunities for collaboration? How many of you are involved with this call gate thing? Uh, well, yeah? Outreach. I don't see why you're not involved. I mean, it might help you in your practice. You just have to write to them and say, I'm going to run this thing somewhere, give me toothpaste and so forth. But it needs to be more coordinated so that there are certain benefits that you get out of it. The way it's structured, personally, I don't like it. It might just be that uh, Colgate is disposing of the toothpaste that are just about to expire. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying. Could be true, it could not be true. I don't know. But if you don't have a coordinated project, that is going to be done one for your business purposes. So if we structure it correctly, there might be a, a business objective that we want to determine for yourself, whether it helps you with revisitation and so on, but it should be a planned study. We can also look at the times or the trends and say, if you do it at this point in time, how helpful is it and so forth. So we can actually have a question a question that we then investigate nationally, given the project, and maybe make changes to the way they deliver on these issues, right? Brushing programs. These brushing programs that are done in schools, I wonder how hygienic they are, right? You know? We could develop a mechanism and so forth. There are many engagement projects where ideas can come through and do it, you know, so that we do it participatory. You know, some people are going to like it, some are not going to like it, but those are ideas. Uh, I'm talking about National Oral Survey. I think I'm done with that. I've said it not once, many times. The mentor mentee projects, what is on clinical level, on research level, on teaching and learning level, that has to happen. You know, you match people who have experience, whether clinically, because they've been there for a long time, but you have to do it after creating a network. 
At some point, we need to input that information into this database so that you can match. If information is missing, you cannot match people. But these are some of the ideas that are there. Advanced clinical training, I think DPA is doing some of that through academies and so forth. But there are some of you who have certain skill set, then you can create this database of people with skills and match them as well, right? So that they advance. The issue here is that universities don't have monopoly of knowledge. They might be on the cutting edge of generating it, right? But there might be individual outside the academics who have certain skills level. The only thing that we need to do for all these sectors is to make sure that there's a level of accreditation of sort so that you can deal with chances. They're always there. People are going to take opportunities, but no. I mean, he can go for additional training and he's certified by a body that can take accountability. And when the skills lie in that particular area, there's no reason why you cannot have advanced clinical training for everybody else. You know, so that we, 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 in academia, they talk about decolonization and massification of education, right? So what happens is that there mm, can be the reserve of the few now. You open it up for everybody else. So we need to start looking at those opportunities as well. You know? But critical is dissemination of information. If all of us are going to be doing meta-analysis, you know, and all these kind of studies, this kind of collaboration could serve as a repository for giving you evidence, right? I mean, we do a whole lot of meta-analysis in my department. Uh, we link with many centers, you know, collaborative centers in the world. So if there's any research question, I mean, especially intervention, if you don't know if A is better than B, you can send me that question. Within a week, I'll find you an answer. That's for sure, especially in dentistry, because we have a collaboration. So I'm saying we could then do that and look at the evidence and start to provide you with the evidence. So these are some of the initiatives that I think as a start we might have. You guys might have other ideas that I think we want to incorporate. And that is the idea of this kind of meeting, that uh, we're sitting sometimes idle. We see sometimes with our own questions, right? But I mean, if you have questions from yourselves, that will begin to improve the quality of our research. You know, because we tend to sit in niche areas, ne? you know, and only when you get different ideas, they help you know, to improve on your questions, the quality of your research, and the output that you have. So I'm giving this presentation selfishly, you know, because I'm hoping that you guys are going to say, yeah, I want to work with other people, and how do you help? Doesn't matter how big or small the project is, there are a whole lot of people who are willing to take it. But don't, don't go for conditions like, um, uh, I'll leave it for now, I'll, I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay, I should be done. I think I rushed through it because I need to go back and understand there's a, there's a notorious uh, a traffic jam here, Jimmy, somewhere here, just before you join the N2. Yeah, and if I get stuck there, I might not make it to the airport. Yeah, but I'm open for, for, for a few questions, Dr. Twal, and comments. Uh, and if I stepped on your toes, public sector and private sector, that's my own experience. I just put a disclaimer, eh? we can deal with this some other time. <laughs> Why me? <laughs> okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, very interesting. Um, you've touched on the National Dental Practice-Based Research Network. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming uh, it doesn't exist. Not in this country. Okay. But it's a model, it's a model that I, I was part of it for a brief time when I was fortunate to, to, to get a scholarship and work, uh, work and study in the U.S. You get into a practice, they incorporate it into that network. You know, for dissemination, of, it's, it's, it's a national thing. Yes, people opt out, you know, it's voluntary, but there are models for that. The U.S. is strong on it. Yeah. In this country, I don't know. Yeah. So um, I, I can just imagine that uh, there's many people here who are, you know, quite excited about, about this particular concept. And 
but how do you think it can get off? How, you know, how do you think you know we, we can do it? You know, just briefly, you know, from a, a governance point of view, a funding point of view, operationally, collaboration, and so on, just quickly. Yeah, well, I must commercialize it. When I say commercialize, it's a non-profit scheme. Well, I don't want to be part of it and run it, but we must generate uh, some form of administrative capital to keep on running it. It requires people to run it. You have to set up a very strong uh, IT infrastructure to run it, you know, for people to get feedback, to put questions and so forth. I mean, there are very many people who are interested, you know, to, to support it financially, but they need economies of scale. You know, obviously there's Popia Act and things like those. We're not going to give them some of this information about yourselves. But they also want to be part of this process to leverage, you know, and, and get something back. But spoken to a few individuals, I'm not going to mention them here. And uh, if we really have to study it and say it goes, I'm not part of it. It has to run its own life. Networks, when they are done by, by practitioners, eventually they become the board of that kind of network. You know, you pull out, you go. It's, it's a voluntary. So as a start, I mean, we could base it somewhere and say, maybe DPA must run this thing for us in the interim, get it set up, but it's not yours. So they, there's a very clear distinction. You know, it's a voluntary organization run by practitioners themselves who are going to determine his vision, his mission, and so forth. Say political, it say whatever, and so forth. Yeah, you know, but he has to run his own life. It's it's conceptually is hard, eh? but I mean, very easy to do. Only if you have the numbers. N equals to something. Yeah, no, no, no. The the, the money is going to follow the numbers. Well, I've spoken to a couple of people from NetBank about this idea. I mean, they they want to then target you with their things, right? But the board will have to determine that eventually. But the, 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 the impact you know, of such a network is unimaginable. I mean, it's research-based, eh? nothing else. And research, research works. We really, really need to make sure that we incorporate research in our practices. You know, then you're likely to get people in, 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 in the pharmaceuticals coming through, people in and so forth and so forth. Remember, we've not done health systems research even in our practice. How to fund the practices, et cetera, et cetera, the back office and so forth. It becomes an opening for, for, for people like in the commercial or whatever to... You're getting me now? Okay. So, so yes, conceptually that can be done and there are people who are interested. You know. It's going to take a lot of work initially. We need people who are committed to get it off the ground. But once it runs, it's a machine that keeps on giving because it's not going to stop. No. I haven't spoke to somebody from some radio station. How do we help people when they have ideas like that? Ah, yeah, we have, but it was, yeah. But I can give you those details uh, if you want to follow up with those individuals, you know, and, and get it off the ground. But it has to. I, I'm not going to be in the forefront. I want to sit in the background and say, okay, now we have to do some research. I'm going to help out, you know. Um, yeah. Thank you, Prof. Are there any questions from the floor? It's not so much of a question. It's, it's more of a comment, possibly a bit of a regret, <laughs> that we did have an opportunity a few years ago to do something about the oral health survey mm. because that's... Uh, what for, from everything you've said, that's that's really touched me a bit because it said that as a profession, the last time anything was done was Van Vake, yeah, 2002, and uh, since then we haven't. I know Mzimkul is sitting there. A few years ago, when I also had some influence in oral health, we did try. It is one of uh, first my personal regrets indeed that we didn't make much progress then. Because at the time, the thinking was that the universities would collaborate. Remember, mm. SMU, VETS, UP, and all of that. But I don't know whether that has gone. Umzi, Umzi may well know better than I do. Because then that would have helped us a lot with policy making around planning, costing, budgeting. It is still difficult as a policymaker sitting 
and you don't have the hard evidence to, to support you. But then I'm just thinking as a secondary question that perhaps uh, I know this guy in, uh, well, the prof in um, uh, Pretoria, Ayu Yusuf, I think there was a lot of thing done with the saying, hey, what is it, South African Health and Nutrition yeah. Health think, Survey, yeah. maybe looking at uh, this tobacco, uh, what is Demographic Health uh, Survey, then the census even, you know? So maybe if we opportunistically l use the existing surveys that are there for something else, yeah. and just stick in oral health somewhere there, that may well, I don't know how much mileage we can uh, get out of that, but we seem to be, haven't made much progress since then. But I'm thinking of those, because the diet, dietitians guys and nutritionists guys may well be onto something there, but may maybe something has been done, I don't know, thanks. Uh, thanks, Prof. Mutluba, with your presentation. I, I think I, especially with collaboration, um, I'm happy that it's coming from the side of the tertiary institutions, training institutions, but collaboration from me as a public health servant, that's where it fails from the training institutions. That's where we do not get. Uh, I hear the study of 2002 saying, van Vick, van Vick. That's another problem I have as a public health professional. The, the study for under 6, 6, 12, and 15, that is the study we're talking about here, excluding the adults, was the National Department of Health survey. But it was given to universities to lead. Medunsa had a, Duplessis was, had the provinces to do that. We had a protocol. And then uh, in Gauteng, I think it was host health and, and then um, UP was dealing with some provinces in Western Cape. So it was divided on that. Why? Because universities, we assume academically, they are the ones who can lead that. But when those studies or results were out, Van Vick publishes his. That's why now we're sitting here saying it's a profound fix. It's wrong. It's not his study. It's a Department of Health study, which when it came up, he published as his. He's a professor. It's not a theft of academic knowledge. It's wrong. It's published in SADA, in general, which I queried when I came. That is wrong. You cannot take what is divided amongst all professionals as a... Um, um, as an asset, if you will, for an institution like Department of Health, and put it as your own publication. That's wrong. I, I want to correct that. That's not his study. He published our study as his. That's number one. Number two, personally, as a public health international, I have a problem with university. They are fighting amongst themselves. And as a result, even the study we tried to do, National Oral Health Survey, it was differences above themselves. A community service uh, dentist specialist. What do we put? How do we do it? And it frustrates that. Uh, but the third point I want colleagues to understand, it's very costly to do service. I'm trying to raise funds now, but I, I wonder if even if I could have a 40 million, how am I going to work with them at the university because they fight among themselves. But if you look at South African Demographic Health Survey, what we try to do, because it's done by Human Science Research Council, we try to put some questions to look at the social determinants of oral health problems, with identify as dental decay, pain and sepsis, and gingival. So if you look in those also, you can pick up some of the things as a social determinants from that survey, which is a huge survey actually, it comes every two or three years. I think we've got it up to now at 2016 results of that. So for me, rather than looking at a bigger only oral health surveys, look at those also small um, no, integrated surveys like South African Demographic Surveys where you've got a section on oral health and also you can do your own uh, analysis of those. Thank you. The purpose of, of academia, right, is, is to engage issues. And when you do, 
And when you do amongst you know, yourselves as experts, you know, one of the things that I've thought about is that there are no holy cows. You know? And when I say there are no holy cows, the reason why this survey has taken the direction that it did, now that you phrased it and Jimmy says that, uh, I mean, the first people thought they were going to bully us. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> no, 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 it, no and, and I'm going to keep it there. It does not work like that. When you have, when you have an academic question, you address it as academics. You take the politics and the emotions, you put them aside. I'm going to tell you now, and I'm going to say it because we have this forum. You don't need 40 million to run National Oral Health Survey. And let me break it down to you, and I've done it before. If all of us who are sitting in academia, specialists in dental public health, cannot analyze the data, then really, who are we? We're not trained very well in our profession, right? So that's one thing. We can do that. So you don't have to put a course for a statistician out. Number two, we're talking about collaboration. It doesn't matter where you're going to do the survey. You will find therapists, oral hygienists, and dentists who are employed both in private and public to do the legwork. It's a question of engaging them because this is going to serve them. So where are the cost drivers? So sometimes we need to start to think different. And I raised this issue with all of us as specialists. And people decided to do a pilot on, on the data that, or the data elements that some of us had not discussed because some people are holy cow. It doesn't work like that. If people do that, no, no, I'm not going to be part of it. Then you are going to say we have fights. When you are a payer of all of us, somewhere you step in and say, this is not going to happen under my watch. You guys sit in that room and resolve it because I pay you in the best interest of this country. And these are the issues that I don't want to talk about because we all know about them. I mean, I don't like bullies, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but we can have this engagement. It has to happen. And when that happens is that uh, we have the resources. This is the collaboration that I'm talking about. Find me part of this country where we don't have an oral health personnel. And remember, when you sample, you don't have to use all of them anyway, because people can cover certain. We had divided ourselves as institutions that the SMU is going to target Limpop and whatever. We're going to find those resources within our schools. So it's a question of, I mean, I don't mind. I don't have to sleep in a five-star hotel. I'm going to then crash in his house. You know, you put a sleeping bag and go and do the thing. The cost can be driven down for the social good, for the good of this country, because we need to do that survey. That is collaboration. So you cut all this fat that is sitting and is escalating the cost. If the analysis is so hard, I mean, I'll go and sit with, with the state South Africa or wherever, one, two days, then I do it myself. I mean, give me an analysis that I don't know. I'll spend five days on Google and I'll get it right. I don't have to then go through the genus and the genus and the, you can even get a video of a complicated statistical test and do it. We are academics is our job. So sometimes we really need to start to think creatively about the solutions that we want. It's not going to cost you 40 million. If it's going to cost you 40 million, I wonder what the uh, uh, elements of your balance sheet are. It cannot do that. You know, somebody who's giving you that, that tab has inflated the prices. It can't. It's going to cost you to accommodate me. It's going to cost you to then set up some, uh, you know, IT system to collect the information and small gadgets so that when people go, the input the information is pushed up into a central database, right? We don't lose data and training. That's it. Nothing else. But we can talk about outside this office. But the truth of the matter is that the, we didn't fire. Some people came to a fire. <laughs> with a knife, when some of us were not armed. So what do you do? You walk out. Yes, sir. Hi, Prof. I want to say thank you so much for what you said earlier. It's re I, I, I would like to consider myself a junior researcher. I've got minor publications and some ideas floating around in my head. Um, I, I was part of this committee, and Dr. Ndwandu as well, where we tried to establish e-health for KZN. And the intent was to help to get DMFT oral hygiene statistics and things so that anyone who required the information had it available, 
they can bring it to publication. But I think it wasn't well received. Perhaps it was my fault. I didn't help develop the software or the technology well. So I'm asking if it's possible at one stage, maybe we can sit over a cup of coffee at my expense and we can <laughs> <laughs> try and improve this so we can contribute to it. You can do better. I'm listening, Prof. No, 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 not coffee. You can do something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I was excited he's on our motto, doing better. <laughs> Thank you so much, Prof. Um, I think that was getting very interesting. Learned a lot there. So thank you. Before you miss your flight, we have something very special for you.